Hello, my name is Matt Foy. I'm a retired salmon restoration biologist. And part of uh, my uh, work over the last few decades has included working on salmon habitat restoration projects on the Coquitlam River. So the main theme of this uh, story will be an effort that a number of individuals and entities have uh, have uh, begun over the last 15 years to restore sockeye salmon to the Coquitlam River watershed. And I've given a name to this story just to give a sense of the challenges ahead on how to do that. It's called carving a way forward. And there is no good science on how you restore a sockeye salmon run to a river once it's been lost. So like carving, it's a series of experimental uh, actions, uh, typically involving uh, letting fish perhaps move through structures like dams and, and see if they would go to the ocean. Or in this case, there's a discussion underway and an agreement to build uh, an experimental conservation hatchery for sockeye salmon that should be completed in the year 2023. So this is a story about some of the past uh, effects on the Coquitlam River, some of the efforts done to restore salmon to that watershed over the last decades, and perhaps some ideas that might be worth uh, looking into by the restoration team working on trying to restore sockeye salmon to the Coquitlam River watershed. So one of the first major impacts on the Coquitlam River occurred very early in the 20th century by the construction of Coquitlam Dam. And it was the outlet of a natural lake, Coquitlam Lake. And it started out as a modest structure uh, just after, just the very first years of the 20th century. And then it was upgraded uh, from water supply to a power supply. And this was the most recent upgrade uh, about a decade, decade ago to upgrade it for seismic. But it's a now very large structure and it denies uh, fish access past the dam into the, what was the Coquitlam Lake. So the other impacts of the dam was it, it's uh, primarily for uh, hydroelectric power development, and that's done by diverting water from Coquitlam Lake through a tunnel into Bunsen Lake and finally into Indian Arm. In other words, it was taken out of the watershed. Like, likewise, it's one of the major water sources for Metro Vancouver. About 30% of the water for Metro Vancouver comes out of Coquitlam Lake. So again, the water is diverted out of the watershed. So the reality is the vast majority of flow that would have historically moved out of Coquitlam Lake no longer enters the Coquitlam River. And the Coquitlam River is a fundamentally different stream. So it's a much smaller stream in terms of flow. And that has had effect on the salmon populations over the, uh, over the past century. So this particular discussion is around sockeye salmon. And I, I would just like to add that the Coquitlam First Nation, whose community lies at the mouth of the Coquitlam River, um, is taking a lead role in trying to bring back one of these species in particular, and that's sockeye salmon that would have lived in Coquitlam Lake historically. And we're going to talk about uh, that and, and perhaps a little history of the development of the river and actually what steps have been taken to reclaim some of the habitats that were lost earlier in the 20th century. In the last two or three decades, there's been direct efforts to restore salmon habitat that has paid off in some results that should give people some a sense of optimism that restoration of salmon in Coquitlam River is possible. So the other impacts of development on the Coquitlam River related to land use and of the uh, floodplains in the lower portion of the stream down closer to the Port Coquitlam, Coquitlam area, uh, city of Coquitlam area. So that include gravel mining of the river itself. Gravels were removed from the river. Hundreds of thousands of cubic meters were actually taken from the river 
for construction material from the early 20th century right into the 1960s. Um, and and from partly from that, the river was channelized. So a lot of its historic flood channels and side channels and habitat diversity were lost as the river was excavated down to a very narrow path, primarily to protect the developing cities of Poco and the city of Coquitlam in the area. So all these had impacts in the beginning parts of the 20th century. Less water, uh, more disturbance of the stream, a simplification of the stream. So what did that do with uh, related to fish? So the dam, when it was constructed, denied access to sockeye salmon to the upper watershed. So that sockeye salmon was extirpated. It died away. Uh, the other species we believe that was present in the watershed were Chinook salmon, likely used the uh, outlet of the lake or the upper portion, possibly tributaries to the lake, but it disappeared very early around that time. There's not good records about Chinook salmon. Uh, pink salmon would have been a very abundant salmon, probably the most abundant salmon historically, but due to this lack of flow in the fall, heavy gravel mining of the spawning beds, uh, the last recorded Coquitlam River pink salmon spawned in 1957 when the fishery officers recorded the last 25 spawners. After that, there was no pink salmon for decades. Uh, by 1969, um, the comments from the fishery officers were this river, the Coquitlam River, had ceased to function as a chum producer, chum salmon producer of any consequence. And as early as 1961, they recorded only 25 chum salmon that they could see in the river. Coho salmon, the other species present in the Coquitlam River, in that same area, era would show 100 spawners, again indicating very, very low uh, numbers of fish left beginning through the 60s. So at the end of the 60s, uh, government regulation changed. And uh, the BC Gravel Removal Act came in that, that forced companies not to take gravel out of rivers just for construction material. It would be only to protect homes and lives for flood protection. So effectively, gravel mining of the Coquitlam ended around 1969. But that gravel mining uh, was to service the growing uh, communities in the area. So those mines moved out of the river and up the side hills of the Coquitlam and there's large gravel mines in the center part of the uh, Coquitlam River watershed that do have issues when it rains heavy of fine sediments, the clays and silts washing into the river, which does have impacts. But the direct impacts on the spawning grounds were greatly reduced after 1969. So enough of the bad news, let's talk about something uh, more positive. And we are talking about potential restoration of a lost species, sockeye salmon. So let's let's talk about some of the actions that have been taken uh, beginning in the late 1960s, as we just described. Uh, no longer was gravel removed from the river itself, just for building material. But in the uh, late 1970s, um, a little hatchery uh, as part of the salmon enhancement program, partnering with a local Fish and Game Club, the Poco, Pork Coquitlam and District Hunting and Fishing Club set up a modest little hatchery up by the uh, Metro Vancouver watershed gate, a few kilometers just downstream from uh, Coquitlam Dam. And it goes by the name today as the Grist Gosen Memorial Hatchery. And they began uh, fish culture of coho salmon. This is a big male coho salmon in the picture and chum salmon. So both of those species had very difficult decades in the, up to the 60s, but the uh, 70s became more positive. People really didn't want to lose these species from the river. Uh, so they became releasing uh, small uh, juveniles in terms of coho fry into various habitats and a later, later uh, chum fry and then sometimes smolts that have been reared for a year in the hatchery in those big tubs behind these two individuals. So that began in the 70s and carried out till to this day. So what else happened in, in that era? Well, in the early 1990s, there was an agreement struck with BC Hydro 
to release more water from Coquitlam Dam for benefits of fish and wildlife in the Coquitlam River. And also funds were made available both from BC Hydro and other funding sources to do direct habitat restoration along the remaining floodplain areas on the Coquitlam River that had not been developed for cities. So a whole range of habitat restorations projects were constructed primarily focused on coho salmon the species you're looking at here but they did have benefits to chum salmon a little later there was a project built uh, uh, about 1995 uh, just below coquitlam dam called the grant's tomb pond and there was a small spawning channel and uh, at that point uh, it was used for the enhancement and re-establishment of pink salmon. So before we talk about the pink salmon and we leave this discussion about the Griscosan hatchery, there was another species that were lost to the watershed very early in the 20th century. I mentioned it was Chinook salmon. So that this hatchery played a role in bringing eggs and juveniles from the Harrison River population of Chinook salmon. Uh, and they were incubated first at the uh, Chilliwack River hatchery. And then those eggs, after they had developed uh, to a certain level, were brought over to the little hatchery and then incubated and reared and released into the river. Uh, Chilliwack hatchery also provided some smolts, juveniles that had been reared full term at the hatchery and brought to the Coquitlam River. All these actions were trying to reestablish a species that had been lost early in the 20th century. And uh, the Chinook releases from and the relationship with the Gris Gosen hatchery and the Chilliwack uh, River salmon hatchery continues to this day with an annual release of Chinook juveniles into the Coquitlam River. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the other species that I mentioned, pink salmon. So this is just a picture of the, the technique used to re-establish one of the species that had been lost by the original development of the watershed, pink salmon. Now pink salmon have a relatively simple life history. They spawn uh, in, in the main flow of the river, often sometimes in side channels. Uh, those eggs incubate over the winter and around beginning of April. They, the little fry come out of the gravel and then immediately leave the uh, river and head down to the ocean. So they don't require a lake to rear in there uh, like a sockeye salmon. And they don't require rearing in streams for a year like coho salmon. They have a very simple life cycle. Uh, but they no longer existed in the river since 1957. So eggs were brought over from a, a population in the Fraser Valley in the Harrison River, a tributary called Weaver Creek. And how would you release them? Well, this simple incubator, you can see people loading uh, eggs. These are eyed eggs. Uh, eyed means they've been incubated in a hatchery to make them uh, more resilient to handling. And they were uh, collected over at Weaver Creek on the Harrison incubated to eyed at the Chehalish salmon hatchery, and then brought to what was Grant's Tomb Pond spawning channel and put in these little trays. And then this unit was placed in the spawning channel and those fry incubated till spring and then they were released to go to the ocean. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, about 200,000 pink salmon eggs were incubated in 1995 and released and in 1997 and that was the only time that these eggs were brought back into the river and then the fish were left to uh, figure it out when they returned, find new habitat, spawn in the river and everyone wondered what would happen. Would, would you be able to re-establish pink salmon in the Coquitlam River? This was an experiment and there really was nothing known whether it would work over the longer term. So let's just wrap up uh, this discussion about the history of uh, restoring salmon in the Coquitlam River so we can move forward on discussing uh, restoring sockeye salmon. But just to give, to restate some of the history, 
if you go back into the records, the Fishery Officers records, back to the earliest records that I have access to is 1947. It was no Chinook, no Sockeye, 75 Co, 3,500 pink salmon, and 1,500 chum salmon recorded in the Coquitlam River in 1947. Now, don't forget, this is uh, more, almost 30 years after the construction of the dam in the headwater section and the diversion of flows. Uh, gravel mining and other development had occurred in the river even by 1947. But uh, you can see the most dominant numbers of fish were pink salmon, followed by chum salmon, and then coho salmon. So looking uh, after the description of various actions that have been taken over the last three or four decades, trying to stabilize the habitat in the watershed and restore what was possible, uh, what do we have now? So BC Hydro, as part of their water use planning process, uh, did a, a number of studies that looked at, uh, estimated the escapement of salmon to the at least the upper three quarters portion of the Coquitlam River watershed. And uh, there is one year that I think is probably the high water mark for at least the last decade uh, in terms of numbers of fish, but I think it's important to talk about that. Uh, 2013 was uh, a particularly good year, a very good year for marine survival for species like pink salmon right up down the west coast of British Columbia. Now after 2013, we ran into a, what's called a marine heat wave also known as the blob. So many of our populations of salmon throughout British Columbia suffered from about 214 through 217 when the heat wave was in the ocean. And of course, fish come back at uh, different ages. So it even persisted into 2020 and 21. But here we are in 2022 and we're seeing some recovery of species, for instance, like chum salmon. But let's look back on uh, the good old days, which are relatively recent, 2013. What did BC Hydro uh, report estimate in terms of spawning numbers of salmon? So Chinook salmon that had been extirpated for almost a sec century from the watershed were recorded as estimated at 2,400 adults at that time. Now, many of these adults uh, resulted from hatchery releases, but some were nat from natural spawning but a very, very large number, 213. Uh, again, uh, zero or uh, less than 10 sockeye recorded uh, in the river. Some sockeye had been, re been returning to the river from experimental water releases from the Coquitlam Reservoir, which allowed some of the resident, uh, what we call kokanee, to choose to migrate to the ocean. So there was a handful of sockeye uh, they estimated uh, a very high number of coho, 13,000. Um, again, this estimate is just an estimate, but a tremendously high number. Now, pink salmon that ha had been extirpated, as we talked about in 1957, and returned in 1995, well, actually returned in 1997, um, they recorded a number of 42,000 pink salmon. And that's about 10 times as many pink salmon as was recorded in 1947, the first year that the Fisher Author records uh, were available. Chum salmon, uh, 1947, 1500. Well, in 2013, they recorded 34,000 chum salmon. So again, I just want to point out, there's been lots of actions taken by a, a broad array of people and organizations, all working together since about the late 1970s. Um, there's so many individuals I'd like to name, but I just can't because there is so many individuals um, and organizations that have been involved with this. But I think we all have to understand that the Coquitlam River salmon population compared to the, the generations before is in a very strong recovery mode for many of the species I just discovered, just discussed. But uh, now we're talking about a species, the last species to be dealt with in terms of a hard focused recovery effort and that sockeye salmon. So sockeye salmon, the, the recovery effort began uh, roughly, as I recall, somewhere around 2005, 
Uh, how many years ago is that? It's 2022, so that's 17 years ago. When there were simple changes to how water was released from Coquitlam River Reservoir in the springtime. And what the science uh, was looking at is there was no longer a nandrobosphore form of sockeye salmon in the Coquitlam River. They had gone, were been extirpated 100 years ago. But there was a resident form still in the reservoir that lived their whole life cycle in, in the lake. And the question is, would they, in fact, portion of that population decide to migrate to the ocean successfully. And in fact, in 2008, uh, I believe uh, 10 sockeye salmon, a nandromous form, returned to the base of the Coquitlam Dam from those early study uh, uh, experimental releases from the dam. So this is where this sockeye story begins. And I just wanted to build it on the foundation of some positive results that have been occurred have occurred in the watershed from actions taken over the decades for these other species of salmon also damaged during the development of the Coquitlam River watershed. So let's talk about sockeye. So I thought I'd start with just talking about the general ecology of sockeye salmon in our area, let's say the lower Fraser Valley area. So the majority of sockeye salmon will enter uh, Fraser River, uh, migrate up the Fraser River, find its tributary stream, and swim through uh, that stream into a headwater lake. And the reason they're heading for a headwater lake is the majority of sockeye salmon in our area uh, live as a juvenile for one, possibly up to two years, in a lake environment before migrating to the ocean. So this is a picture of a sockeye spawning in the upper Chilliwack River. And the upper Chilliwack River flows down into Chilliwack Lake as an example. These fish spawn anywhere from mid-August into to mid-September. And what does that mean? It means that that uh, reflects the average water temperature of this cl relatively clear water stream uh, over the winter so they can they, their timing of their fry coming out of the gravel is roughly April 1st. So the earlier you spawn colder the water is on average. When these fish are spawning, perhaps the water is, is 15 degrees, but in the winter it may be at one degree or two degrees or half a degree for long periods of time. Effectively, it's the average temperature over the winter. Eggs develop so many thermal units, let's say conceptually, it takes a thousand thermal units for a sockeye egg to incubate from an egg to a fry coming out of the gravel. What's a thousand thermal units? Think of it at 10 degrees Celsius, it would take 100 days to come out of the gravel. So it's simply math. The earlier the spawners, the cooler the water. The later the spawners, the warmer the water. On the coast here, uh, warm water comes from large lakes because lakes sometimes uh, hold the summer heat at depth and release it over the winter. Example might be the Harrison Lake, very large lake. So that's why fish that spawn below Harrison Lake spawn a little bit later in that flowing river versus a river, perhaps like the upper Pitt River, comes out of a mountain, no significant lakes, uh, cooler on average, and fish would spawn uh, earlier in the upper Pitt River. Same species, just an earlier run. So the typical uh, sockeye here on the coast will spawn in a tributary stream to the lake, like, like this example, upper Chilliwack. The fry come out of the gravel, let's say on this conceptual April 1st, and their goal is to get to the lake as soon as quick, quickestly as possible. There's a high predation rate on, on sockeye fry as they migrate. So they typically migrate in the dark, in the middle of the night, sometimes moonless nights or stormy nights are the best. But their goal is to get to the lake as quickly as possible to avoid as many of the predators in the stream as, as possible. Um, typically sockeye don't migrate uh, on, on these spawning trips necessarily that high in the stream because the same thing if if they can migrate in a single night to the lake that's better than being so far upstream it takes multiple nights to get down to the lake it just exposes them to more predation so again the lower ends of streams are often uh, targeted by these species that's the dominant form another form that is not as common spawns uh, called beach spawning 
They often are on the deltas of uh, tributary streams where there's some groundwater, or sometimes in certain lakes, if there's consistent wind, they'll be on windy points where the wave action is creating some sort of water movement through the gravel. Uh, just talking about the mechanics of egg incubation, a little sockeye egg in a red has to have uh, water moving past that egg throughout its life cycle. I remember it's something like 100 centimeters an hour. It's really slow, but they do need movement. So how, do they, how does that water flow happen? Well, in the stream that we're looking at here, just the velocity of the river and the roughness of the bottom and the slope of the stream push water particles and oxygen through the gravel, through the red, past the egg and downstream at a slow rate. And that egg then has healthy incubation. In a groundwater situation, we have hydrostatic or pressure from an aquifer. There's water fed into the aquifer at a higher elevation. It's going underground. It may be captured by layers, silt layers and clay, and then it discharges under pressure. So it moves. So often fish are spawning on groundwater upwellings, they're called, and they're really seeking that water movement past their egg. Those are the two general forms of uh, spawning for these species, and, and actually salmon in general. It's the idea that still water doesn't work. There has to be a movement past these eggs in the red. So we'll talk more about, about uh, that related to the Coquitlam Reservoir and what we think may have happened historically to change the habitats and what various forms of sockeye would uh, be appropriate to exist in the Coquitlam Rock River as we find it today. So what we see in the Coquitlam Reservoir uh, <clears throat> today in terms of Onerka spawning is uh, it appears the dominant uh, strategy is to spawn in the lake. Uh, I'm assuming they're spawning at depth. What I mean by that uh, is below the zone of drawdown, the active drawdown of the reservoir. Uh, so on the Alouette River, when uh, returning adult space that came from resident kokanee that had migrated and had returned were tagged, sonic tagged, and tracked to the reservoir. They found they were spawning it at actually quite a deep, deep, uh, deep areas, 30 to 50 meters below the surface, well below the reservoir fluctuation. And that may have been an adaptive. These are the survivors from a lake being converted into reservoir. They're below the zone of effect. Uh, we know they're groundwater based. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a, a study following this uh, slide uh, because they're found to be spawning more in October, November. Surface uh, spawning fish, uh, for instance, in the Chilliwack, you know, late August, September. In the upper pit, late August through September. That idea. So, Again, this is the form in the Quitlam Reservoir that survived all these changes. Now, was there uh, a significant stream uh, spawning population in the Quitlam Reservoir before development? There is um, uh, records suggesting there was a uh, multiple timing groups. Um, when I say timing, they moved through the river at different times, suggesting they were subpopulations in that that leads me to suspect that there was a group of fish that would have come in perhaps earlier uh, through the lower river, entered the lake, and then spawned more in this late August through September period. Uh, where would they have spawned? Probably the lower ends of these small creeks. Now, these creeks aren't particularly large, and we all know by late August, September, the driest period of the year, so small streams, streams are even smaller so it's likely if the sockeye did uh, have a stream spawning population, it was in the bottom ends of these streams. They may not be able to get up very high. The deltas often uh, provided them the opportunity to spawn in these dry years, just where the streams came into the lake. Uh, maybe in a wet summer, they'd go a little farther up. Now, unfortunately, uh, these anandromous form sockeye, uh, if they did use the lakes, they, they're they now would have to exist as resident forms, so you would expect uh, 
uh, resident forums to still uh, use these streams. And perhaps they do. I don't know how well this has been studied. I have not heard of any significant numbers. And it may be partly related to, again to the fact that this is not a lake, this is a reservoir. So if you think about it in late summer, uh, late summer uh, lakes and reservoirs are at their lowest level. Fish come in to spawn. And maybe when the fall rains come up, the a natural lake might come up a meter, sort of a normal height, a meter higher. But a reservoir may go up five meters or 10 meters or 15 meters higher when the rainy season happens. Well, what that means is the most the most likely places that these stream stream spawning fish used, the bottom ends of these smaller streams, uh, are inundated. So they become still water environments through the winter. They're not adequate for incubation. So in many ways, these fish would have been attracted to the lower ends of these small streams, spawned, and then those eggs would not be viable once the reservoir refilled. It's likely those stream uh, spawning populations declined. I don't know if they've disappeared totally because there may be populations that move higher in the streams. There was one large stream that feeds Coquitlam uh, Reservoir, very similar to the Upper Chilliwack. It would be a, a stream almost identical to the picture we're looking at. Uh, lots of gravel, lots of flow, or significant flow late summer. Perfect place for spawning uh, Onerka. Unfortunately, there's a uh, salmon barrier very close to the Coquitlam Lake Reservoir, and the fish just can't get into that upper upper river naturally. And I'd like to talk about that later, but naturally that, that larger stream was inaccessible, so the stream spawning populations were limited to the smaller tributaries, so I suspect they were a, a much smaller component of the total run. The total run likely always related on uh, on lake spawning populations, uh, whether or not they always spawned at depth. There might have been a much stronger component at the delta fronts, the groundwater delta fronts of these various streams. But again, with these great movements of um, water elevation, it affects how groundwater upwells and where it upwells. It's likely that spawning at great depth, getting out of the range of these uh, fluctuations was a strategy that effectively survived converting this uh, Coquitlam Lake into an actively managed reservoir. So this is the situation we find ourselves today. And I think it's worth discussing what would what strategies could be used for restoring sockeye salmon to the Coquitlam Reservoir that accepts the watershed as it is today. So here's just a cut and paste out of a report of um, when the first sockeye returned in 2007 and 2008. Um, there, it began an initiative to see if this possibility of recovering an anandromous sockeye run from the resident Kokanee or resident Onerka population. So an egg take was done by collecting the uh, resident form fish in the lake. And if you see some of the, um, if you read down, uh, it talks about uh, egg takes occurred from October 22nd to November 23rd. So that's a very late spawn time. And that, that's clearly based on a groundwater. Now groundwater is warmer um, through the winter, so they, those eggs will still come out of the gravel on April 1st, but the average temperature perhaps is, you know, six to eight degrees Celsius, even on the coldest day of winter. So those eggs are just incubating on this groundwater at depth. Um, <clears throat> what else uh, important from this uh, report? Um, they produced, uh, I think they had a target of 5,000 smolts. Uh, they may have released only 4,000. And if a 1% one survent, one survival to small to adult, they would get 50 sockeye back. That was the hope. Uh, I know marine survival for sockeye used to be 5%, but, but recently the marine conditions have been poor. So 1% was a very conservative return rate. Uh, the challenge is this. Uh, from that release, uh, these eggs were taken. Uh, they were taken to a hatchery on Rank Ground uh, that does sockeye salmon, Rosewall Creek. They were turned into yearling smolts, so they, they uh, 
took them around the lake rearing phase, took them to a yearling phase so they would be ready to migrate to the ocean. Then they were returned to the Coquitlam River and released just below the dam, as I recall. And there was an expectation fish would return. In fact, no adult sockeye returned from this release. Again, highlighting uh, this is uncharted territory trying to take resident form Onurka uh, back to an anandromous form. We know it's possible. We had 10 fish return in 2008, but it's not easy. And perhaps we have to uh, use all the tools, our experimental tools, to see how we can, if we can accelerate the recovery and improve the marine return rate of fish uh, coming back to the Coquitlam Reservoir. So a little bit of optimism, a couple more points from this uh, study. So looking back at that uh, original release in 205, they estimated only 620 um, smolts went to the ocean from this resident Onurka population. They were able to navigate the Coquitlam Dam and go down the river, 620. So if 10 fish returned, uh, that's actually higher than the 1% uh, return expected. Now the difference between these two studies, one study was based on a subset of the resident fish that chose to migrate. We don't understand migration and resident versus anandromy. It could be a very small proportion of the population maintains the desire, the drive to migrate to the ocean, a very small proportion. Those 620 uh, sockeye did return about, a, looking at this, a one and a half percent survival back to the river. Now, contrast that to when you took eggs from resonant kokanee that had not chosen to migrate. This was just a general grab of the population and we got no return. So this just highlights, this is all uh, unknown territory, but it also probably points to where uh, we probably will have uh, potentially better luck in focusing on the returns uh, to the dam that have already shown that they migrated they dealt with the ocean successfully and returns. Those fish are very, very valuable. Unfortunately, uh, to date, we haven't been able to have significant returns to do an experiment to see if we took those into fish culture, could we get uh, much higher survival back to the dam. We'll talk a little bit about one of our uh, parallel uh, watersheds over in the Alouette that have been looking at this uh, for the same length of time. And before I forget, I just wanted to point out, it's highlighted in red, uh, a comment made in this report from uh, 215 uh, program. It says, to our knowledge, if successful, this would be the first establishment of sockeye based on residual kokanee in the world. So, as I said, we're going to talk about a parallel uh, study on the Alouette River. Uh, that in fact has returned an anandromous sockeye, just like at the Coquitlam, uh, from a resident four. But also, I'm going to talk about at least two other studies that I'm aware of in the Columbia River. They're doing very similar things, and I think what they're learning will uh, will inform our program on the Coquitlam, on the Alouette, and brings. Uh, some points that I'd like to discuss about moving forward, what we might do in terms of strategy on how to move our program forward in, uh, in a reasonable way that we can have the highest chance of successfully uh, seeing an anandromous sockeye returning consistently to the, uh, the Coquitlam River watershed. So the situation over on the Alouette watershed is almost a twin of what's uh, has gone on in the Coquitlam uh, watershed. Uh, both had headwater lakes that had natural populations of anandromous sockeye salmon that were extirpated by the construction of dams very early in the 20th century. So in fact, the first uh, sense that juvenile uh, resident form Onurka might uh, choose to migrate to the ocean if given the uh, chance occurred on the Alouette River, not on the Coquitlam River. We were looking at uh, potentially how to restore sockeye salmon to the Alouette River watershed. 
and one of the tests as it was being done is there there's a spillway so we were spilling water in the spring over the spillway from Alouette Reservoir to Alouette River now this normally did not occur in the spring and what we were simply doing is using coho smolts from a nearby hatchery to see who, if smolts left the Alouette Reservoir could they survive the fall over the spillway well when we were releasing the coho smolts at the same time a very significant number of these resident Onerka smolts migrated at the same time. And this is where uh, people started to say, would it be possible to reanimize a uh, sockeye population from the resident form? So over on the Quitlam Reservoir, uh, the flows were changed there the next year because of what we observed on the Alouette. So the Alouette is about a year ahead in this study. And also it has some natural advantages. So when the original sockeye recovery team started to form, uh, it was agreed in the beginning that we would use uh, the Alouette River as the experimental watershed to inform what to do in Coquitlam. Now I understand that the two groups have separated and they're looking at their own studies, but it's still my opinion the Alouette has a number of natural advantages that will inform what we should do, or at least inform what we should try to do on the Coquitlam River. And I'll give an example. In uh, Alouette uh, watershed, they have a spillway, so the water can be released over the top of the dam. The natural migration uh, behavior of salmon smolts is to go in an outlet of a natural stream. This, the sun above you, or the moon above you, or the stars above you, it's not natural to go into a dark tunnel like we have in Coquitlam. So the Alouette has a more natural outflow that we can do more uh, tests to see if these uh, an Onerka will naturally migrate. The second thing is Alouette Lake is being fertilized to make it more productive for Onerka. Primarily the resident form as a form of compensation because it's a hydroelectric reservoir, not a domestic water reservoir. What does that mean? It can produce more Onerka. That's the intent of it. it, makes it more productive. We can't do the same thing in Coquitlam. It's going to be a low productivity uh, watershed because it is used as a domestic source. Again, the Alouette is almost a twin, but it has less human constraints on uh, reestablishing anonymous fish. So what do we learn in the Alouette? So, over the years, uh, every year, this water spilled over the spillway and fish migrate. And Onerka residents smolt and migrate. We don't know the exact numbers because it's not monitored. It was in the early years. But we are, what we are monitoring is adults return because there's been a long-standing fish fence a little ways below the dam. So it gives us very good numbers. So what have we learned? Uh, we have learned that we can have a consistent, anonymous uh, sockeye salmon return to the Alouette Reservoir. And here's the numbers on the right. But what I have also see from this pattern is when the adults came back, they were just simply driven around and put back in the lake to spawn naturally. And those juveniles would have to compete with the resident form of Onerka. And it, to me, what I see the pattern is, I don't see a pattern of increase. And what I mean by that is, by these fish going to the ocean, they are much larger than the resident form. When they return, they carry more eggs. That's the advantage of anandromy. You basically, you have to have a higher survival and a larger body size. You get more eggs in the gravel, more fry into the uh, environment of the lake to compete with the resident form. And it's all about numbers, which, which per, Perf egg in the gravel, what brings back more eggs to the next generation? And right now, it looks to me that I don't see any signals that this anonymous experiment uh, is providing uh, a positive trend for population. So let's just have a look at that. I've sort of broken it down in four-year increments from 207 to 210. And I just added up how many fish left um, or came back or came back in that four year period 204 came back to and were placed in the lake in the next four year only 58 came back 
the next four year, 22. And it looks like uh, we're moving into a more productive phase in the ocean. We're now at 119. The message is you would hope by doing this, uh, this uh, experiment, we would see a slow trend toward increasing numbers, but we're not. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a declining number, but it's not an increasing number. It's somewhat stable. It looks to me uh, a run roughly 50 to 100 adults. And that's interesting because I'll show you another study that's looking at it too. Now, what does this say to me though in terms of Coquitlam? I think there's an opportunity here to go back to our, our first uh, first assumptions that the Alouette could help inform this, to what to do over on the Coquitlam, and I'm going to suggest later what that might be. So there's a few more studies I'd like to talk about, but that idea of linking the Alouette and the Coquitlam once again, I think, is, uh, I think should be a high priority. So what Alouette has is returning adults that have survived all the challenges, migrating from the reservoir down the river ocean and returning. And some years significant numbers. Uh, and they don't appear to have a trend, an upward trend that I can see in terms of returns. So I think uh, for the benefit of the Alouette, uh, sockeye anatomy experiment, an experimental release from uh, eggs taken from these returns would be well uh, well worth the effort for the Alouette project. But at the moment, uh, they are not set up to do that in the Alouette watershed. But the Coquitlam watershed is. What the Coquitlam watershed does not have is these numbers of adults returning yet. The plan is to continue to try to collect kokanee eggs so we will get adults return that's the hope but we've done it once and had no 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 return that we were aware of it so that may fail but even if it doesn't we get our fish back it'll be another four years before we even get a sense are we going to get fish back or are we going to fail again that that'll take us eight years so i'm looking at the alouette numbers i think a quite practical uh, solution would be to do an experiment, continue to do uh, egg takes on the uh, Coquitlam resident form, perhaps the very first year, do a significant egg take and turn these fish into smolts and release them as they did back in 2017 and hope for a better result. And the word is hope. The second year, take uh, an equal number of eggs from the Alouette river return and hoping that there's enough for for that egg take and you can see some years there's virtually no fish so there's no guarantee of this but if there is a return and those fish can be uh, held long enough to survive to do the egg take take those into cultures at Co Coquitlam turn them into smolts ensure that they are all marked and return them to the Alouette River for release so what that will do is that will give a sense we've done an experiment on letting fish uh, naturally uh, leave the lake and return but now this is the second generation where you're rewarding those that return and see what sort of survival you would get if you went through a hatchery culture now this will inform the alouette program for years ahead they're talking about other things like fishways right now but this will give them a leap forward but it will also give a sense to the coquitlam watershed if they do get adults returning, what sort of uh, potential benefit will they get from taking them into fish culture? Do you double the survival? Uh, how, how is that going to work? If, if we believe the original uh, return from the Coquitlam River 1.5%, that that's, appears to be an acceptable return if we can get that from these enhanced fish. So really, we can only run the experiment in the future in the Coquitlam, perhaps for to eight years out, or we could do, run the experiment in year two from the Alouette if the Alouette group and the Coquitlam Restoration Group came to came to an agreement that this made sense for both their interests. Anyway, I think it's very worth uh, discussing, and I think I'll talk probably the end of this presentation of some other variations.
on this strategy. So this is one of the areas that I wanted to highlight. Um, I view it as a parallel study to what's happening on the Coquitlam and Alouette. Uh, in this watershed, same thing, there was large dams constructed for irrigation and hydroelectric power that denied uh, sockeye salmon access to uh, a lake, headwater lake. It's in the Deschutes Basin, that's a major tributary of the Columbia River. And uh, it's a big study. Uh, lots of capacity, lots of uh, excellent science. And when I look at when it started, it started, interestingly enough, virtually almost uh, a few years after the original uh, studies on the Yellow and Coquitlam. I don't know if there's a link there, but it's, uh, it's interesting about the timing. And we'll talk just a little bit more about this uh, report. So you can Google this report, as I recall, it's 619 pages long. There's a lot of information to go over with. However, it's really interesting, and I just cut out a couple of sections that relate to what we're trying to do on the Coquitlam River Reservoir. You can see the goals are very, very similar. Restore a self-sustaining and harvestable populations to historical sites in the Upper Deschutes Basin. And they talk about a large number of resident kokanee from Lake Billy Chinook uh, have been utilized to begin developing an anandrobus sockeye run. So this is effectively the strategy that's being discussed now on the uh, Coquitlam River. So in their case, they're talking about juvenile kokanee that exhibit migratory behavior and enter downstream collect collection facilities are marked and released downstream of another dam downstream. And then as those fish go to the ocean, there are some adults returning that are captured as a fish trap and then passed upstream around that dam to spawn naturally in their historic spawning grounds or move to a round butte hatchery. So this is really interesting. These folks are doing almost the exact same that we're trying to do at Coquitlam uh, watershed and I suspect their capacity and science is really uh, uh, deep because this is a major hydroelectric watershed, the Columbia River, and there is large amounts of funds to do these sorts of studies. So I just cut and paste a, a summary. Half a million yearling kokanee and sockeye have been captured uh, moving uh, downstream. That's a lot of fish for this study and it's been released below the, the Butte Dam. But here's the caution. From those fish, uh, they've only seen modest gains and returns of adult fish did not exceed 100 fish till 216 went over 500 fish. And all uh, genetic analysis suggests mo these fish, 90%, originated from Lake Billy Chinook. Again, as was pointed out, this is all new territory. But these folks are generating some really strong numbers and they have, uh, it looks like they have a hatchery program to see if multi-generational uh, returns start to improve their marine survival. Again, I, I would recommend the planning group uh, pull data and make uh, reach out to this group because I think they're going to break trail uh, for us and inform us to give us hope and give us a sense of where, what, priority we should give to certain types of experiments in this new sockeye facility that we're, we're all hoping to see uh, built by 2023 on the Coquitlam River. So this is the second watershed in the Columbia that I think uh, relates to what we're discussing on the Coquitlam watershed. It's Klee Elam Lake and it's in the upper Yakima Basin. And if you read the little preamble, it was a significant producer of sockeye salmon. They say 150,000 to 200,000 spawners a year. And effectively the same story of a, of a dam built at the outlet early in the 20th century. And the run was effectively extirpated. So in this case, uh, this group has looked at uh, the genetics of the resident form, and considered various studies about the fish cat. And they've decided actually to look into 
uh, bringing in nearby uh, populations of Anandrobus sockeye to recreate what was lost. And they talk about to increase the genetic diversity and life history variability, thereby maximizing adaptive potential. What they're basically saying is they're reopening the watershed and they're bringing other populations in uh, and then studying them to see exactly what happens. Once again, I think it's a it's a program that should be watched closely and probably discussed uh, in relation to the Coquitlam Watershed Program to see if it has some application for what we're going to be doing in the next number of years. So I just threw this up. It just shows the relatedness of various sockeye populations within the lower Fraser Valley, how they all link together. As, as we've discussed, each lake is viewed as a unique population, typically a unique conservation unit. But we've also discussed Coquitlam Lake no longer exists. It's now Coquitlam River or Coquitlam Reservoir. It's a managed environment with all these, all these uh, factors that will limit the shape and nature of the sockeye populations. Uh, we have a dam we have to get juveniles through and adults past, whether it's trap and truck, cap capturing them and driving them around, or in the future, potentially a fishway has been discussed. But for, for the foreseeable future, it's very likely going to be a trap and truck. Uh, now, what does, that, what does that mean? It means that we can do experiments to reanimize, as we've discussed, the population that survives in the reservoir. And that probably will be our primary focus. Uh, the hope is that, that those fish can be anandamized and turn into a consistent sockeye run. But could we do, do other things parallel? Uh, because I've also pointed out that that may fail. That may not provide a reasonable return or, or a return that people think is success uh, to that watershed. So is there other things that we could look into? Well, one of the things I think is quite possible is to always consider Coquitlam and Alouette as two, two closely related populations. Alouette has some natural advantages, um, spillway, uh, ongoing fish trapping, as you see there's adults returning. And there could be a, an argument made that in the future, after a number of cycles of effort, if there's still not significant adult returns to the Coquitlam watershed, would and yet, yet there, if there was sig enough returns to the Alouette watershed, if somehow uh, those two populations uh, could be used to supplement each other. In other words, if it was successful in the Alouette for whatever reason and, and unsuccessful, uh, perhaps uh, males from the Coquitlam could be used anandamous males and some eggs from the Alouette to create uh, a population that's related to both, but this is forming the anandamous population of Kikula, which does not exist. It has extirpated that idea. So again, seeing how those two populations, and these fish would though be deep spawning populations that have proven that they can survive in this reservoir environment. So that's, so the the first plan would be to have a Coquitlam only deep uh, uh, spawning Anandrus population. If that appears to be unsuccessful and Alouette is successful, then perhaps in the future they could be uh, create some sort of br bridge population just for the Anandrus form. Would the resident form persist? My guess is the resident form would dominate in the Coquitlam as it always has. It's suited to the lake and the, the anandamous portion will always be a part of that. So that's the first one. The second uh, variation is, as I said, the watershed both downstream and upstream are not the watershed of history. It is what it is now. So if we're already tracking uh, adults and trapping them at the base of the dam, putting them into transport tanks and giving them a ride, uh, could we actually reestablish a stream spawning population in Coquitlam Reservoir? Well, in the smaller tributaries, the answer would be no. Uh, 
But in the larger upper Coquitlam River, the answer is, I think it's possible. So what do I mean by that? There's an anonymous barrier at the lower end of the river, but there's a road network. And once those fish are in a transport tank, it would be very similar to what happens over on the Capilano. When the dam was built in 1954, soon after they started to capture coho at the base of the dam, and they drove them around the reservoir, adult, coho adults, and released them into the upper, uh, upper Capilano River and have sustained the run for 60 plus years. That idea, could we bring a population, a stream spawning population, from the lower Fraser area that would be adapted to spawn in the streams? And the population I actually would suggest is the uh, upper Chilliwack River because it lives in a mountainous stream, it's mid size, it goes to a clear water, relatively low productivity lake. Second, but it's at some distance from the from uh, Coquitlam. But another stream population lives in the Upper Pitt River. But Upper Pitt Lake is a tidal lake, and it's quite complex. It's quite different than. So again, my preference would be to do an experiment with uh, uh, Chilliwack Lake sockeye. So what would be the risk? Uh, you would produce smolts and release them at the base of the dam to see what the return rate of anandromous smolts released at the base of the dam versus uh, kokanee smolts from the from the um, from the Coquitlam Reservoir population just to see what sort of benefits. If it looked like anandromous fish were surviving and returning at a much higher rate as they returned as adults, you could choose to take those adults and bring them to the upper river above the barrier to spawn naturally to create a summer run population. So that's a, a parallel to the lake. Now, what, what's the downside? From the genetic point of view, when you have fish spawning in August, September, it is highly unlikely they would have any genetic impact on fish spawning in mid-October, November. So that's a good thing. Will they persist in the lake as a resident form? Maybe, but then they would have to be limited to the small tributaries that already don't appear to have a resonant form in them. So it's unlikely. So really the only impact is they would be competing as they reared in the lake with the native uh, resonant form, but effectively they would be competing to produce anandromous fish is what everyone is looking for. So the idea of creating a more biodiverse population related to the, the watershed as it is today, but it's mimicking in some ways uh, the watershed probably pre-development. There's a summer run spawners and a fall run. The summer run is from outside the watershed but uses the physical uh, attributes of the watershed. A stream that is was no, not accessible in the past but again the lake isn't accessible because of the dam. So there's a trade-off. It's a managed system and as long as that dam remains it's likely that trapping and trucking will continue. So that's just as a concept. Um, I think it's worth discussing and talking about and thinking about how would you do it. Again, I think uh, going back to my original thought, uh, I think it would be uh, integrated in a program uh, of some releases of the core population, the kokanee egg takes, as we talked about, a potential year where you produce fish for alouette, just to answer the question, do fish that return give a higher rate of return in the second generation and you do those fish release back to the alouette as an experiment and the third experiment would be if you took eggs collected in the upper chilliwack took them to smolts in the hatchery and released them at the base of the dam what would be the return rate to the dam and then compare it to what it return rate from the kokanee releases and then have a serious discussion if this line of uh, reasoning would make sense again there's no no requirement to release those fish in the lake until these these this information has been collected and a, a deeper discussion if this is what people would like to see. So that's for fish that rear in the lake. Those are the sort of options that I think are well worth this discussing and I'll put a slide up with a potential sort of scenario. But there's a third option that probably has not been discussed at this 
at the tables, and I think I'd like to propose it. This is just a little closer look of the upper Coquitlam River. So just to orient, the yellow star is where the Coquitlam Dam. Uh, the red square is that major tributary delta that we just discussed. Uh, moving farther upstream, the blue line is roughly where the anandromous barrier, the migratory barrier, is on the upper Coquitlam River watershed. It's quite a large stream. And the circle just uh, indicates the picture on the right, the close-up, just showing the road networks comes against the stream. The stream is a medium-sized stream, gravel bedded, relatively low gradient for a number of kilometers, very similar to the upper Chilliwack River, and it looks very suitable for stream spawning sockeye habitat, if it was accessible. So here is a picture of the uh, salmon trap at the base of the Coquitlam Dam, just a little history. The dam was upgraded for seismic, and this trap was placed as part of developing a spawning channel for uh, pink salmon and shook salmon, particularly returning to the base of the dam. So the trap at the time was to capture coho salmon for the fish culture program downstream. But the people in designing the trap understood that sockeye salmon may be uh, part of the story in future years. And sure enough, we have a very viable fish trap at the base of the dam that has proven to be able to capture sockeye salmon. Now, right beside this fish trap is Grant's Tomb Pond, the habitat pond that was originally built in 1995, but it's been modified over the years. And again, it, it could be a very useful tool to look at uh, separating different runs of fish, uh, providing a, a temporary area that they can mature and then be retrapped and put into different habitats. Uh, so again, we have a lot of physical assets that will help with these long-term studies on uh, reproducing uh, various, potentially various run timings into the Coquitlam Reservoir of sockeye salmon. And hopefully uh, we'll have a discussion how to do that in a very practical way in the future. So I started this conversation about sockeye, about the typical life cycle of a sockeye. Migrates from the ocean up to a river, through a lake, spawns in a tributary, and we've discussed uh, variations of that. They spawn in uh, deep in the lake in groundwater upwellings. That's the typical sockeye uh, life history, and 98% of the sockeye in the Fraser watershed follow that. But then there's these odd ones. They're called uh, ocean type, zero plus sockeye or stream rearing sockeye. Effectively, they don't use lakes. And they come up, uh, say, through the Fraser. They go into a tributary. Uh, they spawn. Uh, their juveniles come out of the gravel. And typically, these tributaries are connected uh, to the lower Fraser. And we believe the juveniles then go into the various wetlands, sloughs, slow water, uh, edge habitats all the way down the Fraser. Effectively, anywhere the tide goes, often uh, you'll find them uh, here on the Salmon River in Fort Langley. I recall we found them three to four kilometers upstream from the Fraser River, effectively, basically the top of tide. Uh, now, where do these things exist? Uh, well, I know in my career I've seen uh, sockeye spawning at strange times in groundwater up dwellings up and down the Fraser floodplain. They can be spawning in January. Highly unlikely they're upriver uh, stock strays. These are unusual fish. I suspect they're slew-rearing sockeye. They're very small numbers, and uh, but they consistently go onto many tributaries along the Fraser. However, there's only two populations that are consistent and monitored, and they're each a unique conservation unit. One's very small. Uh, that lives on the lower Pitt River on one of the sloughs called Widgeon Slough, and if you go out the reason I think that their numbers are very small uh, is the habitat they spawn is extremely limited. They appear to be targeting uh, groundwater upwellings at the base of talus slopes off a steep mountainside. So very, very uh, specific sites. Uh, 
They probably compete for chum salmon for these areas, and they only exist in these shallow tidal uh, edges of the lower pit where this transition from mountain to floodplain occurs. I think there's somewhere a few hundred uh, individuals typically in a spawning year. They might get past a thousand. Rare, but an interesting population. They don't they don't rear in a lake and they go to the ocean in their first year. The second population, uh, and this is what this uh, study I think is well worth reading, is uh, the other recognized uh, ocean type uh, sockeye salmon, Lower Fraser, is on the Harrison River. Unlike the Widgeon Slough populations, it, in some years it can be very abundant. You know, anywhere from tens of thousands of spawners up into the hundreds of thousands of spawners. It spawns almost in an opposite environment to uh, Widgeon Slough, where Widgeon Slough is um, in groundwater. They spawn because it's warmer. They spawn, as we talked about, like the deep spawners in Coquitlam Reservoir. They spawn sort of in that very late October through mid-November, even into late November, so groundwater based, but very, very limited habitat to sustain them. The Harrison, on the other hand, is spawned in a very large river, lake-headed river, the Harrison River, large gravel deposits, so they're in this big river spawning in these riffles, but they also spawn relatively late. Uh, because the Harrison River provides uh, a, water, a heat, heat source. It, it provides warmer water than maybe streams running off the mountainside. So there's somewhere between a groundwater, pure groundwater spawning timing and a mountain timing. So again, the upper pit sockeye may be late August to end of September. Uh, I think the Harrison Rapids are sometime in October, maybe drifting into... Uh, November, I don't know if they go that quite that late, and then uh, the Widgeon Slough is more very late October into through November. So that's the three forms. So why is that important? Because uh, I think this form could find a home in the lower Coquitlam River, and I'm going to explain that. So going back in history, pre-development, the Coquitlam River was a much larger river. It would have had a lot more uh, energetic flows. Uh, when you look at the landscape, there would have been multiple side channels, quite a broad delta where it intersected the Fraser River. And uh, just around the corner, we have these little populations still surviving in places like Widge and Slough, and we know other populations in similar sort of river environments. I know uh, we have small runs of sockeye that go into the sloughs on the Vetter River, for instance, quite late spawners focusing on groundwater. Again, another one of these braided streams. Uh, other one comes to mind is on the Mamquam, the Ashlew, or even on the Indian River, we get consistent small populations in these types of rivers that obviously aren't connected with lakes. So they're either strays, but uh, the way and their behavior and their nature and their timing suggests that they're actually unique uh, zero plus sockeye stocks. So thinking back at the Coquitlam River pre-development, it's highly likely there was small numbers of zero plus sockeye in many of these streams, any mid-sized stream along the lower Fraser and the Coquitlam probably had these fish. So could could we reestablish a zero plus population in the Coquitlam River? Now again, similar to our discussion about Chinook salmon, I think we could, but I suspect it would have to be sustained long term by a fish culture program. But if we want Chinook in the Coquitlam River, we've accepted that, and I think this should be perhaps considered for the Coquitlam. These sockeye would be visible to the urban population. They would be spawning in probably the bottom ends, the little tributaries in the back channels along the main stem and the lower Coquitlam River, uh, where their fry would, would survive. Their fry would go down into various sloughs at the bottom end of the river. Many of them have been restored in, in and around the uh, Colony Farm uh, Park. Uh, a number of tidal sloughs have been restored that would be, I think, very good early habitat for this type of population. So again, I think it's uh, another strategy that could be done in parallel uh, to bring sockeye salmon uh, back to the Coquitlam River and the logical population to, uh, to initiate the run probably is from the Harrison River because 
uh, it would be a low risk. It's a large population, similar to the reason we took uh, Harrison River pink salmon and Harrison River Chinook salmon. They were abundant and it's a low risk to do an experiment. However, we also have a hatchery for sockeye and the question I would have, is there a value to do experimental releases of juveniles in this very small population at Widgeon Slough around the corner and do some habitat restoration activities uh, because uh, the latest review suggests that the Widgeon Slough is so small, it will always be at risk of extirpation just because it is small. And perhaps we could uh, do some sort of research using the new facility to both inform what our options are for Widgeon Slough. Could we expand Widgeon Slough's habitat to include the lower end of the Coquitlam River in the future if it became more abundant after fish culture? These are all good questions and I think is, is well worth discussing while we're talking about bringing sockeye salmon back into this watershed. So just one last thought on this program. If we did uh, do an experimental release, let's say of Harrison River fry that had been incubated at the new hatchery to perhaps one or two grams, uh, it is an experiment. So it's the assessment part. I think uh, what when I looked at the lower river, you would separate the releases from the upper river. So to keep the study area in the lower river where their ecology would fit better. Uh, there's a tributary called Monday Creek and there's a, a large wetland, restored wetland area called Cheap Paddocks. That would, to me would be a logical place for early releases into the wetland so they could have a time to acclimate to the new environment, but also to uh, to create a connection for, to that waterway, Monday Creek has a consistent flow. It's a little cooler. It comes off the hill, has some groundwater flow, and it goes through a large culvert before it enters the Coquitlam, where a relatively simple trap could be run. That we could enumerate the uh, adults when they return. This is an experiment, so if you're doing an experiment, you have to have a way to assess it. So this would be a parallel uh, program for the ones that would be looking at lake rearing populations and uh, producing fry from the new facility probably wouldn't conflict too much with um, with the production of yearling smolt. So you could do both these programs at the same time and see what came about of it. So here's a possible scenario for operating the new experimental hatchery on the Coquitlam River. When I look back, we have tried uh, releasing uh, water over through both dams uh, and on the Alouette River successfully returned consistently adults to the base of the dam and transported them into the into Alouette Lake to spawn. But we're not seeing great uh, great trends in in increasing population it returns to the dam base. It may be that this will be the return that we'll see from this strategy for many, many years forward. So can we do more? And this is what this, this uh, scenario is going to look at. Can we use fish culture to accelerate the recovery of anonymous sockeye in Alouette Lake? And if we can do it in Alouette Lake, that'll predict what we might be able to do at Coquitlam Lake if we just keep at it. But we've also learned in Coquitlam Lake uh, the natural smolts migrating did return adults, but when we tried to culture kokanee, we got no adults. Now we're going to try that again, and we're going to up the numbers, but it could be that our results will be very, very poor. So this scenario is effectively putting on bets on different strategies. So after four years of doing these strategies, you'll have another four years or so. So effectively that for the next decade, this will provide data on choices for the next decade. What is the strategy to return anonymous sockeye to this watershed in a way that will provide consistent sockeye runs uh, and do what everyone wants to see is a healthy sockeye run to the Coquitlam River uh, in the future. And in this case, I'm suggesting we consider looking at restoring biodiversity, different timings, different life strategies, uh, not genetically fully linked to Coquitlam. Some may be or will be. If we're successful, maybe the dominant run will be. But also consider bringing in 
uh, new populations to replace ones that have been lost from development in the past. Anyway, this is a scenario for the first four years, and I just wanted to generate this discussion and get people talking. Uh, we have an opportunity to move forward, and uh, it would be nice if we could, uh, at the end of the next decade, have some uh, good solid data on what our next steps might be. So looking back at our experiences on the Coquitlam River watershed since uh, to beginning in 2008, when the first sockeye returned, I recall the very first group of individuals involved in looking at the potential for sockeye recovery did a tour just across the line to the Skagit River to a hydroelectric uh, river that has two major dams and a sockeye population above the upper dam. It's called the Baker Lake on, on Baker River. Now this program uh, at the time were just uh, trying to recover their sockeye salmon that had got to extremely low levels in the mid 1980s, almost had disappeared. And they took a bunch of actions, including capturing smolts, uh, in the upper dam as they migrate out of the river. And then when the adults returned, there is a, a, a trap, and then the adults are captured and taken into uh, tanker trucks and moved above the two dams to carry on into the reservoir and into the upper river uh, spawning area, spawning streams. Uh, there are some artificial spawning beaches that have been created, upwelling spawning beaches. But effectively, uh, a number of activities. So over the years, from the 80s, you can see from this graph, the numbers have increased. And this is during a period of particularly the last five or six years of relatively poor marine conditions. And the population has exceeded 30,000 adult sockeye, which enter the trap at the lower river, are put into tranker trucks and trucked around the dams. An extremely successful sockeye salmon restoration program. Uh, they have slightly different challenges than the Coquitlam Reservoir, but they have been successful, I would say, uh, from all measures to recover their sockeye salmon population. And my hope is with uh, some thoughtful action, the Coquitlam River uh, restoration teams will have similar success in future years and decades ahead.